Good morning, friends and family. Welcome to Worship at St. Patrick. We're so glad to have you here this morning, whether you are here in body and spirit or just in spirit and online. We are gathered in the presence of a God who loves us very much. And so we're grateful to be here this morning. Uh, Before we take just a couple of moments to prepare our hearts for worship, I do want to remind members, you should have received notice that we are having a very short congregational meeting immediately following worship next week for the purpose of electing elders. These are uh, two elders who have previously been ordained but have been uh, off of active service, and so they are being uh, installed, Lord willing, with your blessing uh, by a vote next week. And so that is Dan Stimson and Bob Conrad. And you are welcome to reach out to us if you have any questions about that process or about those gentlemen. We would love to hear from you and talk uh, through that with you. And more importantly, we would love to see you members uh, come next Sunday immediately after worship for a very brief vote to that end. Let's just take a couple of minutes and prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray together. Lord of creation, bless this liturgy, our worshipful work. Fill the forms to fit our hearts for heaven. Breathe your spirit into word, sacrament, and prayer, that we might be renewed in your image and bring glory to your name. Amen. Would you stand and sing? Sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. And Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, join with power. He is able, He is able. make you linger, nor offend us fondly dream. All the fitness he required is to feel your need of him. This he gives you. the merits of his blood 
catechism this year, and we will continue doing that. Uh, if you haven't yet joined us with the catechism, uh, we're only five questions in, so you're not that far behind. Uh, if you have been with us, we're already on question number five, so we're like a tenth of the way done. Either way, it's really good news. would love to have you join us in this endeavor. Let us talk about what we believe from the New City Catechism. Christians, how and why did God create us? God created us, male and female, in his own image to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. What else did God create? God created all things by his powerful word, and all his creation was very good. Everything flourished under his loving rule. Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the lost loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us with his blood. Washed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood. Washed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood. Washed us. He has brought us nigh to God. Let us love the Lord who brought us and pitied us when enemies and called us by His grace and taught us and gave us seals and Washed us with his blood. Washed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood. He presents our souls to God. Let us sing the fierce temptation Threatens hard to bear us down For the Lord our strong salvation Holds in view the conqueror's crown He washed us with his blood Washed us with his blood He washed us with his blood us with his blood, and so will bring us home to God. Let us wonder grace and justice, and join and point to mercy store. And Christ our trust is And justice smiles and asks no more You washed us with his blood You washed us with his blood He who washed us with his blood Has secured our way to God And join the chorus of the saints and throned on high. Here they trusted him before us, and now their praises fill the sky. Thou hast washed us with thy blood. And thou hast washed us with thy blood. Washed us with thy blood, thou art worthy, Lamb of God. Before the throne of God above, I have a Great high priest to say. 
Christ my Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Father, we know this by the testimony of your word. You desire that all would thrive in your presence, regenerated to new life and shining like stars in the heavens. Your heart is to exalt the lowly and those who toil for little reward, making them co-regents with you, making life on earth as it is in heaven. We, the work of your hands, fruitful and satisfied as you bless the work of ours. This great vision for humanity makes all the more disheartening the quietly desperate lives so many of your creatures live. We pray this morning for all unhappy lives, those who are bitter and resentful, feeling life has given them a raw deal, those who are sensitive to criticism and quick to take offense, those who desire their own way, whatever the inconvenience or cost to others. May your judgment and mercy both be for their healing. We pray for those this morning who are lonely, who are shy and self-conscious, who find it hard to make friends, especially now given all of these constraints. Those who are nervous and timid, who ever feel themselves strangers in a world they can scarcely understand. May your presence inspire confidence and ensure companionship. Father, we pray this morning for those who live with bitter regrets, for loving relationships brought to ruin, for opportunities freely given and woefully abused, for the bitterness of defeat or betrayal at another's hand, or for failure in personal integrity. May your grace give new hope to find victory even at the very scene of failure. We pray for all who are in illness and pain, weary of the day and fearful of the night. Grant healing if it be your will, and at all times through faith the gift of your indwelling peace. Father, we pray that you would bless the company of Christ's people, the church in every place, gathered or scattered. Make her eager in worship, fearless in proclamation of the gospel, passionate for caring. Bless us each one in the communion of saints, and keep us ever mindful of the great cloud of witnesses that following in their steps as they did in the steps of the Master, we may with them at last receive the fulfillment promised to your people in your time. As our offerings and tithes of simple paper and metal, or even digital ones and zeros, signify the larger work and energies poured out forth in our daily lives to produce goods in our world, make them be for a sign for us of the fruitfulness that we can have when we make our own lives the true sacrifice for the sake of our hurting brothers and sisters in your image, not rising up against our brothers, but for our brothers in the image of Christ. And we ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated at this time. We'll receive an offering in song and contemplate the ways that we too might be generous. Constantly wrong, what 
Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Thank you for that musical offering and profession of our faith. Would you now stand with us as we profess our faith with these borrowed words declared over generations by the church? Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
worship at St. Patrick, we're so glad to have you here with us in the presence of the Lord and the many saints who are gathered, not just in body, but also in spirit, a great cloud of witnesses as we've spoken of before. It's always our desire to make uh, disciples in the everyday who love God and love people and love life. That's gotten a little bit more complicated recently, but it's still very much who we are and what we're about. And so if you're finding it difficult to connect with the body or to engage in a, a robust spiritual life in this season, please reach out to us. We would love to be creative about how you can connect with the Lord and with one another and be fruitful in this world, exercising dominion on behalf of its king. Uh, would you now just turn and very uh, responsibly greet one another in the Lord? I gotta get some water. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Glad to be here. <clears throat> so if you haven't been here or you haven't been listening or maybe you've been sleeping, uh, we are in the study of Genesis 1 through 4, uh, origin stories <clears throat> in the Bible. Uh, and some people ask, why, why would you look at this? I mean, obviously this is written, the first audience uh, of this is written to people who can't read or write. They're Bedouins. They're kind of wandering people. And of course, now, here we live. Uh, we're modern, sophisticated. We live uh, in the advent of technological advancement, scientific advancement. Uh, we can take a microscope and see into the minutia of the world. We can take a telescope and peer places that ancients, the people that received this, couldn't. Well, here's the, here, here, here's, the, here, here's the answer. How is it that we are better educated, have more means of making life easier, making our lives longer, a higher standing of liver, living than any point in history, and yet the last century and this one have been drenched in blood? Like all our technology has just given us a greater scope. It's like the Prometheus myth. You get technology without wisdom, and it's a great advantage, but it also put it in the hands of people with the proclivity to sin that we have read about in Genesis, that sin is pervasive, then we have a problem. We have problems we have to deal with. And so here we are in this century, 
Uh, it's drenched in blood. Social ills remain. Racism is still here. Violence against the weak abound. So for all the promise of enlightenment through knowledge, uh, thinking we would be better people, it really hasn't happened. So in Genesis, we look at the account that God gives of the world, and we've seen how he built the world, and he uh, put his image bearers in it, a fruitful world, a beautiful world, a world he loved, with creatures he loved to, to, to share the glory back to him. I mean, that's joy, isn't it? You want to share it, have it shared back. And so there's this reciprocity of joy among God and even the, the, the creatures he created. It's this beautiful thing. And then it all goes to pot because of sin. When Adam and Eve want to take the prerogative of deity, they think God's holding out on them, so they grasp at something that might have come, or would have come to them in time. They want it now. And sin enters the world and, and, and rather than abandon the world, I mean, this is the story of God. The Bible is the story of God. It's not about you. It is for you, but it is not about you. It is the story of God interacting in the world. And, and so we really see love. I mean, why would God not do this? If God is love, love does things. Love is known in adversity. So rather than abandon the world he created that's now broken and ruined, uh, he, he dives in. And, and Genesis 3 and 4 and the rest of the Bible is the story of the never stopping, always pursuing, over the top, can't get away from love of God. Okay? A God who will stop at nothing, as, as we will see as we end this text, to heal all the brokenness of the world. And Genesis is a realistic picture of why the world is the way it is. So now with that review, let's read the text. This is Genesis 4. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to read through about the first, we're going to go through the whole text. Let me just read through the first seven verses. Familiar text. <clears throat> Hear God's word. Now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the field, ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your revelation, the stories writ across time, across uh, millennia of your, of your people, tracing our origins to, 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 the, to the, the, the real one, the real seed of the woman who would enter time and space 2,000 years ago uh, to heal and bring healing to all the broken places. Father, we, we see about difficulties of families here. Uh, there's not one of us in here who, who look at this and have not felt something of the anger and the anguish um, of, of, of the dysfunctioning of our own families. And Father, I pray that as we, as we go through this, that you would show us that there is one, there is one who is a true big brother. There is one who is a true author of our faith. So, Father, come to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when we get to the New Testament, 
St. Paul, more than anybody in his epistles, talks about the pervasiveness of sin many places in epistles. And he often looks back at Genesis 3 and 4 to talk about sin and why we need a Savior. And, and as he analyzes the destructive nature of sin, we're familiar with, 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 with that sin comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he gets that from here. But Genesis 1 through 4 invert that order. So the first sin that comes to Eve is through the devil. The sin here we're going to talk about is the flesh. And then, then as, as, as Cain makes his way east of Eden and begins to build cities, then sin and its temptation comes from the world. Now, as we saw last week, the world is not the way it is supposed to be. And the chapter ends with Adam and Eve being driven east of Eden, out of the garden. A cherubim, flaming sword to keep them side. And so, so the rest of the Bible is about east of Eden. The last verse of the narrative, Cain lived, uh, in our narrative today, Cain lived east of Eden. A metaphor of life. So here we are in these first 16 verses. Uh, what is life like east of Eden? We get our first glimpse of it right here. Our first glimpse of outside of, of the joy, the communion, the comfort uh, of what world is, the world is like in its original design before we begin to be our own gods. And, and it's a story of, of going downhill. Uh, the progressive nature of, of sin, and in this story, how it affects family, murder, fratricide, Cain killing his brother. But as we look at this, if you stand back, this really is a picture of life east of Eden. And so what I want you to see what it looks like here is this. Here's what we're going to see this morning. The subtlety of sin, okay? Sin is subtle. The persistence of grace, and then the need for sacrifice. The whole thing starts with the sacrifice. We're going to end with it, okay? So, the subtlety of sin. Now, Adam knew his wife. Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time... Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Verses 1 through 4 give us the first glimpse of life after the fall. There's continuity and discontinuity of life in the garden and now life outside the fall. Okay? Sin has poured, poisoned an Edenic paradise, but there's still beauty. There, there's a growing community. Sin, which has altered everything, has still, there are image bearers. Adam and Eve are having children. We see the vocational promise become to fruition. We see two boys with given gifts that, that, that migrate into the place of, of their callings. They're bringing their gifts and resources to the God who created the world. There's culture making here. It's still a good and lavish creation. One son's a farmer, one is a shepherd or a herdsman. So while sin destroys a lot, it does not destroy our drive for food, for work, for sex, for culture making, for community. None of those are evil. Those are part and parcel of what it means to be human. They're marred, and as such, strange fruit begins to grow because of sin. Perhaps here we see the first dysfunction in the family. Not just the obvious sin of Cain, but the brokenness of family systems. And if you look closely, you see this. I want you to look at these children. I want you to look at the breed. The, 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 the narrative is sparse, but telling. The text is brief on the birth and these children. And the names, names mean things in the Bible. With the firstborn, we read this. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. 
It almost sounds like this exuberant birth, this proud, exuberant joy. And also the naming. Cain's the firstborn. He's the primogenitor. He is uh, the one to whom all the, the, st- the honor is going to go. And he, he's given a name, producer, bringer forth. Kind of stereotypical, over stereotypical expectation uh, of a type A male. But things look different with Abel, both in the naming and how he's just sort of, sort of glossed over. I want you to watch this. So, so with, with, with him, she's talking about gotten a man, and now she had Abel. Okay? Now, just mentioned as a matter of course, and he, 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 he receives a name, which marks him as inferior. His name means vapor, breath, worthless, nothing. Do you like to grow up in that family? Families, the thing we grow in, in subtlety, often undermine so much as these parents in the beginning by favoritism. And in due course, and I'm sure by training and example, by watching their parents, they bring offerings. Obviously, after the fall, there's no offerings in Eve because there is no stated time of worship. All is worship. Whether Adam was with his wife Eve in intimacy and joy and laughter, whether he's farming and gardening, whether they're feasting together, all is worship. It's only after the fall that we have elaborate system and ritual uh, and uh, formulas to approach the deity because of our nakedness and shame. And we see this, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Now what's the problem? Two boys worshiping. Two boys offering at this point on the surface There seems to be no problem, no discernible problem. They're memorial offerings. We see grain offerings in Leviticus as well as we see sacrificial offerings. It's just that God has regard for Adam's offering and and Abel's offering and not Cain. And with that regard, notice this, and we see this all all over Genesis, All over the Bible, actually, God reverses the order and regard that had been set up by his parents. Here's Cain. He's been the primogenitor, the fair-haired boy. No doubt his identity is built on that. And he is the one that's favored by his parents. And yet for the first time, he's held below his brother. Not by his parents, but by God. What is he going to do with this? So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So much here. First of all, notice this. That Abel a nobody should be regarded when Cain a somebody is not. The immediate response is envy. How could this happen? This has never happened. Then anger. I mean, his whole view of himself and his place in the world is shattered. It has to be. If Abel, who God declares, declared him to be, then who am I in my own self-understanding? The logic must continue. If I can't change God's declaration... Then, then I must change or Abel must be eliminated. And of course, we know what happens. Sin, which has taken root in the mind, in desire, in the basic understanding of who he has, breaks forth in murder. See, evil, as Robbie Zacharias says, is not just where blood's been spilled. Evil is the self-absorbed human heart. <clears throat> now, where's God in this? This is what we don't normally talk about. But I want to show you where God is. Just like we don't think God is much there in, in, in the fall of man, 
and, and, and there's love in the ruins? Well, it, the same way here. Sin is operative in the heart, the family, east of Eden, but, it, but, but, but God is active here. And where there's sin, His mercy is more. That's going to be the refrain through that. Where there is sin, God's mercy, even in common grace, as we'll see here. Now look at the persistence of grace. Let me reread this again. When Cain is angry, before his whole identity is being exposed, we read this. So Cain was angry and his face fell. There he is. Now look who shows up. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must master it. Where is God? Okay, so, so here, here's, here's Cain. He is enraged. And God comes to him. God takes the niche. God does not leave him. He does not abandon him. God comes to him with the overtures of grace and favor. In other words, if you do well, will you not be accepted? You see that? This is an offer of repentance. This is not a complete rejection. God, it's, it's like God even set this up to show Cain his besetting sin. You see that? This is an opportunity. All sin is an opportunity. And, and, and we see that all over the Bible. Cain, God is intervening to show him a picture of himself, a true picture of himself. He's built his life on a wrong foundation. And through this, God is showing him himself. God is pursuing him. God is relentlessly coming after him. So, so east of Eden... This is the way sin is operative. Sin is operative and God is pursuing. He's trying to get him to repent. He's wooing him. I mean, no words of condemnation. How, how dare you sin like this? No, no, no. He goes on to give him a definition of how the sin in his heart will undermine him. He says it's like a crouching beast. You've seen it. You've seen this. You've seen the crouching beast, how it works. You're unsuspecting. That's the point. Do you, do you know that feral cats are the most destructive killer in the history of the world? More, I learned this, if you win, if you win this and win money, give some to me because I'm going to tell you this. More species are extinct because of cats than any other thing. Crouching. Have you ever seen one? Just crouching. You don't even know they're there. And the next thing you know, you're pounced on and you're, 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 you're dead. You're dead. You've seen this. Uh, the poor animal is totally naive. It is just, you know, mousing along, doing its best mouse life. And then, bam, unbeknownst, there's the cat. That, and that's what he's saying. Imagine that image here. He's telling that east of Eden in a fallen world, because sin is sort of new. God is, gives his first, like, theology lesson on how sin works. When you play with sin, when you entertain sin, as Cain does here, God is stopping him at the beginning. Sin is a hidden coil predator which has desires to have you. See, sin starts out small in the mind and in and, and a heart of, of bitterness, of envy and anger. But then it begins to produce gossip. Or, or the sneer, or the pout, or the critical spirit. And, and God is telling him how to repent. Master it now. Before sin gets to the point, it takes on a life of its own. You're not the master of the sin, you're a slave to it. See, that's the, this, here's the anatomy of how sin works. There, there's a time we sort of have control. We must master, master it. If we don't, these crouching sins become a force that we can't contain. Miroslav Voss, Miroslav Voss says it like this in his book, Exclusion and Embrace. To commit sin is not simply to make a wrong choice, but to succumb to an evil power. Before the crime, Cain was both a potential prey and a potential master 
of a predator called sin. Cain murders because he fell prey to what he refused to master. That's true today. It's true in my life. I've seen this play out a thousand times. All sin aims at the throat. If you don't master it, it'll master you. Sin's never neutral. Bitterness aims at exclusion. Lust aims at dissatisfaction with your spouse or other sexual sins or addiction. Worry to debilitating depression. Envy to racism and hatred of people that are not my people or complete lack of contentment with the good things God has given you. All sins like that. Man, I have never, I have never talked to anybody in a deeply addictive sin that didn't say, I never wanted it to be this way. And typically, those addictive sins just come as a temporal relief instead of going to the real source of relief. Any addictive sin you've got right now is the thing you run to. But eventually, it's not enough. That's what God's telling him here. Now, then where is God after Cain murders his brother? Does Cain pass beyond the pale of God's grace and mercy? Now remember, we're talking about East of Eden. And we, we begin to see the first, perhaps right here, this whole idea of common grace. One last observation about how God deals with Cain, and it's instructive. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? It's almost like the garden scenario again. He said, I, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So I see his heart there. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying up from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from my hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You'll be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And then here's the Lord coming in grace. The Lord said, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest, he be, lest any who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The passage just almost make you throw up. Imagine life from the presence of God. But after the first murder, God comes to Cain, and again, he questions him. He's totally unrepentant. He shifts the blame. Am I my brother's keeper? And then after that, God curses him. And John Walton is right when he says this. When we refuse to take responsibility for our sin, to accept blame for the consequences, and to be held for what we do and say, we burn down the bridges of reconciliation. And yet when Cain says, this is too much to bear, listen to God's reply. He puts a mark on him, okay? If anyone kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on him, lest anyone he found would attack him. Even, and this is common grace in the world. Where's God east of Eden? Why is the world not as bad as it could be? If, we're to, if, if our instincts are evil, why is there a sin and grace even among people apart from Jesus? Right here. Right here. The mark on Cain is not stigmata. It's a covering. It's protection. It's a mark of grace. It's a sign of God's grace. Even to the unrepentant. Derek Kidner says this. God's concern for the innocent is matched only by his concern for the sinner. Even the querulous prayer 
of Cain had contained a germ of entreaty. God's answering pledge together with his marker sign is not a stigmata, but safe conduct. It's almost a covenant, making him virtually Cain's goel or protector. And he says this, think about this. He says, it is the utmost that mercy can do for the unrepentant. <clears throat> but it's still mercy. It's still mercy. The fact the world's not on fire. It's God's mercy. Our sins, there are many. His mercy is more. Last thing, the need for sacrifice. So let's go back and look at the sacrifice. Lots have been written about this. There's no obvious thing in the text that the reason God has regard for Abel is that it was a blood sacrifice. You can't find a commentator that will affirm that. Not on the face of it. Because the grain offering was just as acceptable then. But, 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 but when we come to the New Testament and we come to the book of Hebrews, we see really the first mention of why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was not. In Hebrews, it says very simply in the, in, in the text on faith, by faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. See, on the surface, there's no difference. They're both religious. Both are worshiping. But one is an act of faith. It's a response of gratitude. It's a response of thanksgiving. Cain's, on the other hand, and this has to be true, I don't know of any other reason you would offer, make an offering to God. It, it's done as a means of leverage, a, a done as a means to get salvation, or, or as a means of, of, of saying, look, look what I've done. Cain's was religious. But it was a means of controlling God or elevating himself. Does, it, does this sound familiar? Does this sound like the whole story of the Bible? Does this sound like Israel in the Old Testament? Does this sound like the religious crowd in the New Testament? I mean, most of the New Testament is not us against them. It's Jesus talking, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, to the religious crowd. There's two ways to bring righteousness. There's two ways to come to God. There's a way to come to God that is sort of self-righteous and putting yourself up. And there's a, like, like the, the publican and the Pharisee, one comes and puts his offering and says, look at me, I'm religious. And the other one is saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. One comes to prove that they're a good person. The other one comes looking for mercy. That has to be what's going on. But there's a second observation. I think Josh and I were talking about this, and he made this observation uh, about the difference in the sacrifice has to be archetypal. But what we know from Genesis 3, what we know in the New Testament, what we know from the blood of Jesus in a text I'll read in a minute. But notice this, Genesis 1, when Adam and Eve sin, immediately they're undone. And what do they do? They pull their own, they, they pull their own righteousness together. They pull their fig leaves they're, they're covering themselves with their own good works. And only later does God in sacrifice and blood clothe them with his covering. With his covering. These have to be archetypal. And, and, and so, one, they're covering themselves. The other God is covering. When we come to this text in, in chapter 4, one, they're almost parallel. Cain comes with the fruit of the ground, the fruit of his own, and the other is a sacrifice. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me close with this observation. We, could, we can just as easily be Cain in this room. There's all kind of religious people. Jesus was always talking to religious people who were bringing their righteousness and we all look good. We're all doing religious things. How do we know if we're worshiping God or not just using Him? 
listen to this. This is also why we know that this is archetypal. Hebrews 12, 23 through 24 says something amazing. Listen to this. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What does that mean? We say here all the time, the whole Bible is about Jesus. We're in the midst of a dark passage, and it's about Jesus. Hebrews is making a connection. What does this mean? Listen to this. Centuries after Abel's blood was spilled, and God said it right, blood spilled cries for vengeance. It cries for justice. It cries for redress. But the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of Abel. Centuries later, a better than Abel came. Jesus, God incarnate, came. Ripped the fabric of reality to, to fulfill the promise made in Genesis 3 that the seed, singular, the seed of the woman would crush the serpent. And, and, and just as in Genesis 3, a blood covering covers Adam and Eve we need that. Centuries labor, later, he came. And Jesus Christ, too, was taken out by religious people and killed. And he, too, offered a sacrifice to God. But here it says, it was greater than Abel. Abel's blood was spilt, cries out only for justice. Jesus' blood while it cries out for justice, offers mercy. Jesus in dying is the justice of God. God has to punish sin. Jesus is on the cross because God must punish sin. But Jesus more is on the cross because to take your sins and impute his righteousness to you. Jesus' blood cries out for mercy, you simply come to him in faith. You cannot get God's approval by your good works. You cannot cover yourself with your own righteousness. But where our sins, there are many, his mercy is more. Don't you see it? It cries out. And when God comes to you, instead of blame shifting, you bow under the mercy. That's the gospel. That's why we do this. Because Jesus' sacrifice is once for all. We're going to come to him now in confession. And, uh, and we're going to come receive him in bread and wine. We're going to receive, because where, where, there's, where, where our sins, there are many. I don't care what they've been this week. What we see right here is the blood of Jesus crying for mercy and showing mercy and pardon. So let's come to him. Let's, let's pray for pardon, and then let's come rejoicing. Let's bow our heads and hearts as we come to him. And now let's pray together as the people of God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. For our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, 
our indifference to the treasure of heaven, our neglect of your wisdom and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, do what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the words of pardon. The Lord is great, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As we come to this table, this is the gospel and narrative. The last word you leave with any time, if even, even the most scathing of convicting, we're, we're just sin, it's centerpiece. The last word is Jesus is more. McShane said, look at, your, look at your sin one time, look at Jesus ten times. Amen, 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 amen. This whole week, do the same thing. Okay? And, and so this helps us. This is for sinners. This is for us. And so this, if, if you're here and you're not a member of our church, you're welcome to come. If you're a baptized believer in good standing in another church, if your children have been baptized and, and made professions, they're ready. If not, just bring them. We'll bless them. If you say, well, I really don't know about that, just come and ask one of us as you come through the line. Just tell me more, because we'll come forward in just a minute. We'll come, and you'll take the bread and the wine and a cup and just kind of stay socially distanced as we come. So on the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. I give my life for yours. The same manner after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the remission of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come. The living and dying of Jesus. The one great sacrifice that speaks better than the blood of Abel. Let's pray. Father, take these ordinary things and feed us. Feed us not on the filth of the world, but on your righteousness, which will rewrite who we are so that the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. So feed us now. Place the fresh kiss of forgiveness on our face so that we would shine and know joy again. Heal these broken bones for Jesus' sake. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's keep the feast together.
Our sins, they're many. His mercy is more. Hallelujah. That's why we end with a song and go out into the world. So let's conclude. The Bible says that after they had feasted together, they sang a hymn and departed. So let's do that as we sing and prepare to depart. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my pardon, this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as stone No other bound I know Nothing but the blood of Thanks be to God for Jesus. And uh, as we leave, if you need somebody to pray with you, you got questions, you got pain, you got anything, uh, you got need, uh, the best place to run is to Jesus. There will be people up front would love to pray with you, uh, talk with you, direct you, just be with you. So if you, if, you, if you really need that, just go forward. There'll be people in the front. Uh, if you're visiting and want to know more, there's when you leave in the narthex on the right there's a connect table josh is there he'd love to love to visit with you okay let's receive the benediction as we depart i lift my eyes to the hill from where does my help come my help comes from the lord who made heaven and earth the lord will keep you from all evil he will keep your life the lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore amen go and serve christ mm-hmm.